and welcome to the TTS Talking LEAs podcast. Each week we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe who offer exclusive insights, inspiration and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. Hello and welcome back to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Alistair Bryce Clegg, and I'm joined today by Kate Silverton. And we've been talking about all things early years and also the real importance of developing children's mental health and resilience. So in this last episode, Kate, and literally I think we could have probably talked for a week, how about we try and pull together some of the things that we've talked about, but also give some real practical strategies of things that maybe practitioners can share with parents about how you can positively work on your children's mental health? Yeah, sure. I think to me, start with the science. So uh, to all be fully aware of how our children's brains develop and which parts of their brains are driving behaviour <clears throat> at different stages of life. So the first year for a baby, it's that lizard part, the reptilian part. Then it goes into the limbic system, that baboon that's very social, but it doesn't really tip into that social side until about three years of age. And it's not way, way, way until after that that there's what the prefrontal cortex, what I think of as, as the wise owl, really comes into her own. She only really comes online at three, but she doesn't finish her full sort of mature development until our children are in their 20s so we can't expect children to well we shouldn't expect children to be able to regulate all their behavior um especially under five so to kind of seeing our children differently and we'll see a different child it's that concept of instead of looking at behavior and thinking this is naughty behavior is thinking actually this is behavior driven by a child who's got a very primitive brain that's driving it And that brain is mostly focused on safety and security. If it doesn't feel safe, the behavior won't be safe. So that's it for me, is to really understand the science. I've explained it in this metaphor. I should say that in case people are joining this podcast for the first time. When I'm talking about Elizabeth Boone and Wiesel, that's a symbolic (laughs) representation of of our brain. But to really understand the science, because that equips us to then enable us to use our own wise owl, our prefrontal cortex, and use our intuition. Because everybody's going to have a different practice, a different, you know, different child that they're dealing with, different children. But when we can step back and think not what's going, what's wrong with you, but rather what's going on for you right yeah. now. And then how can I help? And that I think can can really help to to sort of shift how we approach children. They're not naughty. You know, my book is called There's No Such Thing as Naughty. And I absolutely absolutely will take on anybody who wants to debate that with me (laughs) because I'm really adamant that we must start seeing children differently and that's when we see the difference in behavior the second thing is just to focus on safety Um, keep it simple like what does this child need if they're not behaving if they're behaving in a way that is unsafe that is erratic that seems irrational yeah it should tell you that their nervous system their lizard and baboon are freaking out so yeah. therefore, it's like, what can I do that will help them to feel safe? And we use our body language. Most of our communication is nonverbal. So little children, especially when they are in that stress response, when they are um, sort of spinning out, is words don't cut through. So telling them, stop doing this, don't do that, you're just being silly, really are just not helpful and they won't even work because the part of the brain that's driving that behavior is not the thinking part of the brain it's a very reactive unconscious part of the brain so we've got to use our body language and that can mean getting down to the sort of the height of the child don't loom over them because that physical presence actually triggers the stress response even more so using and then Thinking about how we sound, does does my voice, am I speaking slowly? Am I using very few words? Because that little baboon, if it's doing backflips, the amygdala, <laughs> is really not hearing not me. So yeah. Use very few words. You don't you don't feel safe right now. How can I help? So getting down eye contact. So getting engaging that child, not in a threatening way, but engaging that child so they're really, I see you. I see you and I want to understand. And then how can I help? 
keeping our language simple, our body language to align with the child um, and understanding that it's about safety. Once the child feels safe, their behavior will be safer. And I think for practitioners, again, reflecting on that and challenging some of the expectations that you might have been given or that other people might have that are unrealistic about what well, behavior management is not even a term that I like, but how you honor and value children as individuals. Because we keep going back in the early years, we talk a lot about the unique learning journey and the unique child. And so we need systems in place that honor that uniqueness. And you're not going to get all children who process and behave in the same way. And that idea that if you can think about the science, like you're saying, Kate, and brain development, and the fact that children will struggle to share because they haven't got that kind of empathetic feeling towards other people. They're just about self-preservation because that's kind of how nature intended it to be. Then when they display very selfish behaviors, again, they're not being naughty in inverted commas because naughty doesn't exist. What they're doing is being typical of human development. And if we understand that, then you're less likely to say, you know, give that back or what we've probably all done as early years practitioners back yourself into a corner where you've said, well, that's not going to happen until you do that. Yeah. And the child hasn't got the capacity to do that. So then what happens in, uh, happens in parenting as well? You just, your threat level gets higher and then your threat level gets higher mm -hmm. to the point where you're threatening ridiculous things. And actually the action is never going to happen because the child is not capable of that action. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And on that sharing, absolutely. Sharing is not caring in, into that baboon brain. It's all about yeah. survival. So we're, we're expecting too much of a child if we're expecting them. So just doing things long term taking. So, oh, I see you really, you really, really love playing with that car. OK, well, Charlie would love to play with it, too. Can you see his face when you're finished? Do you think you can come and give it to Charlie? That is how we start modelling the behavior, the empathy. Empathy exists in the prefrontal cortex. It's the wise out part of the brain. The baboon doesn't do, it's not about empathy, but it takes a, we have to have a sort of theory of mind. I have to be able to step into your mind to understand yeah. that it's going to really upset you if you don't get to play with the car. But that requires a part of my brain to engage that isn't fully, I mean, it comes, it comes online at three, but it's not fully functional until we're in our twenties. So we have to start modeling the behavior that we want to see. And if we're raising our voice and shouting and using lots of sort of harshness with the children, they're not getting that sense of regulated. We want to, if children are dysregulated, it's our job to sort of step in and wise out them, not to shame or to shout. It's actually to sit alongside and say, I get that this is really hard. Now, just a point on this, because I also know I can hear people going, it's all very well, but, and I get that. And why is it hard sometimes? Because if we haven't been given that empathy, it can sometimes be really hard to tap into it. So again, I always sort of think maybe we can sit with ourselves and kind of go, what would I have liked? What was my experience of childhood and nursery and preschool life? What, what would I have liked someone to have said to me? And to, how do I want to be understood? If I came up to you right now, if you and I were at a restaurant or something and you had your, you'd ordered your massive piece of cake and I suddenly dived in, you know, and, and, and took it from you, you, we all have a reaction to things. When yeah. things are done, we have to start thinking, what would work for me? And how would I like to be supported? And, and not to blame or shame if we haven't been doing this either, because we all do things, you know, in terms of practice and parenting. Absolutely. We were either parented that way or, you know, I mean, that's a very powerful thing is, is if we've been very shouty, either as a parent or in a, is to sort of say, do you know what? I've just been thinking, and this is what I would do with my kids and say, do you know what? I've been thinking, I've been a bit shouty. I've not, I've been a fun sponge mum. I'm really, really sorry, guys. My baboon has been up. I'm just tired. Daddy's working. I mean, I'm solo parenting quite a lot. My, my husband's abroad for a lot of the time and you know and I say guys I'm really sorry I, I should have been kinder that sh that wasn't great it's just that I'm, my baboon's up and out I take it on my shoulders it's on me it's my behavior yeah. if I'm dysregulated it, what does that tell me I'm 53 and I'm pretty good at my emotional regulation but sometimes I will tip over if I'm very tired and stressed and I'm juggling a lot of plates. That's not my children's fault. Yes, I'd like them to listen if I'm asking them to get ready to play, but I can then say, guys, actually, do you know what? I've just shouted and I shouldn't have done. I'm really sorry. I should be using a kinder voice, but can you please 
put your listening ears on and then we'll get in. And the change in that behavior, they'll, they'll look, they see me and they kind of go, okay, she's actually struggling right now. Yeah. And they want to collaborate. It's the way we engage with it, but that comes from relationships. It comes from connection. It comes from our children trusting us. And I work very hard as a mom at doing that. It isn't that I'm sitting here thinking that I'm sort of paragon of perfect parenting. I'm absolutely not. I've had to learn because I, my death was a shouter. So, you know, so I have to then think, actually, I'm shouting. I don't want to shout, but I'm doing it. And saying to our children, do you know what? I really want to parent better or t- I want to be better. I get my children to rate me when they were younger. I was, you know, I'm like, well, how can just get it? was great, you know, I was like, yeah, I got that. but it was mostly like, I want you to play a bit more, mum. And, and you're thinking, oh, I have been really. So, having this sort of much more playful to be able to get into a playful state with children is beautiful. And you see this sort of like, because otherwise, children take it on them that they're wrong because we're adults, we're the sort of the gurus, we're the gods. <laughs> where they will always internalize, I yeah. must be wrong, I must be wrong because I'm always stuck on the sad cloud or I'm wrong because they're shouting at me. Actually, it's because I've had a really tricky day and my stress response is on. So just saying, you know what, I'm really sorry, that was on me, I shouldn't have shouted. How should I have been then? We're modeling that behavior. So my children can now apologize if they get things wrong without any shame or blame and say, sorry, mommy, I shouldn't have. I'm just disappointed because you said I had to clean my teeth and I'm in the middle of a game. All right, Will, it's okay. That's how we need it to be. Yeah. It takes investment. I'm not saying it's easy. And I have to do it daily, even though my yeah, it's, are it's, it's consistency. And it's about that not trying to appear like a perfect parent, which I think lots of us want to be, want our children to think we've got this parenting game sorted and actually the fallibility is the important bit because they learn what it is to be fallible which we all yes. are yeah. much like you i think we are about the same age i mean i was whacked with a wooden spoon that was what my dad he was not a bad person and loved us but he had been whacked with a belt and so the wooden spoon was one step down from the belt for him but he wasn't short of a clip around the ear or a whack with a wooden spoon if we'd misbehaved I mean, that was part of his management of our behavior and again, it's we're talking about different times and we're talking about how you know we are sitting having a completely different conversation that he never would have had. But me as a parent and me as an, an early years practitioner, I come from a child who, if they stepped out of line, was whacked with a wooden spoon or clipped around the ear by a parent who also really loved me and I felt secure in that relationship. But it's a real kind of mixed bag of messages. Yes. And then... That obviously influences your parenting, and but not just of your own children. It influences how you interact with other people's children because you assume the role of the adult, which can be a parent role or a practitioner role, which is really the role of the parent in situ. So I think, again, acknowledging that and understanding why maybe you were parented in the way that you were brings with it a sense of almost forgiveness if that's not too strong a word if you if you the fact your parent and think yeah it was a bit shouty it was a bit physical but that was because that's how they believed good parents parented As and a, now i think differently yeah that's what you saying with ed- education practice we think about when i was trained in the early 90s what what a day in reception looked like it was about on the carpet, I deliver at length, we go off, we do activity work-based sheets, then we come back to the carpet, we do another input, we go into activity work-based sheets, then we play in the afternoon sometimes while I hear readers. Well, there's nothing like that in the culture of early education now, but we believed at the time that's how children learnt. What we know now, although we don't see it everywhere, is actually children aren't capable of learning in that way until much, much later on. So rather than giving them a help what you're doing is actually giving them a hindrance. Yeah. Well, play is work, you know, and uh, this, you know, play, this is the part of the brain that we want, the social brain, the baboon brain, you know, at these very early years is actually all we should be focused on. And actually that is in free play. Now, I, I also must make a really clear point about boundaries because very often when we talk like this, I know a lot of you hang on a moment, you know, you've got to have structure and boundaries. You do. Children do need. If children don't have boundaries and structure, they can feel that they're going to fall off the end of the world. Yeah. So that can be just as scary. This is not about just letting everything rip and everyone, but actually to keep it, we can keep it really simple. The only rule, and, I, and again, for anyone who's only listening to this podcast, I'm w- working as a therapist with children with very high need. Now, 
the only rule, and I hate the word rule, but it is a rule, it's a boundary in the therapy room is I don't hurt you, you don't hurt me, and we don't hurt the room. And there's things they can do in the room that let them anger yeah. and, and everything out. But I'm very clear on that. And as much as my clients, I want them to bring anger and, and physicality. That's my job as a therapist. It's not, you know, but, but beyond the therapy room. But I have never had a child who hasn't overstepped that boundary because it gets put in. That's the only rule. We can do everything else. Everything else is, but we don't, I don't hurt you. You don't hurt me. So if we can just have that one, but rather than put, you know, sort of there's no hitting, we don't hit others and they don't hit us. And that's it. That's that's the only real big lesson that children, yes, and then the structure can help with, okay, this happens then. That can be really nice and holding. But within that, play, 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 yeah. play and movement. You know, Yak Panzer, very, very influential neuroscientist, actually has said 20 years ago that he felt that ADHD was because children weren't playing enough, especially boys. Boys need to have their, and you know all about this, you know, with your doctorate and everything. With I know your studies that you're doing now. That, that we, uh, big motor, you know, we need to be playing and moving around. Children at this age are not meant to be sitting still on the carpet. It's it's actually painful for the brain. So these are the when we understand the neuroscience, we start learning and thinking. Hang on, it's actually causing physical. It's the same activating in the same part of the brain that where we experience pain. So when you think about that, it's like actually the child is, they can't. And we're forcing them to sit still. They're not designed for that. So we've got to go back to the science. And then we start creating a system, which I don't even like the word system, but we, uh, 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 you know, we have to have a system in place. Otherwise, sort of society breaks down. But to, to have it that is designed for the child and for what their brain needs, we are all in the brain development business. We want to do our jobs well. And we can either sit here and say, well, I can't do it that way because, or is that I won't do it that way? We've got to think I can do the best that I can possibly do by implementing at least some of these strategies that in the main are going to help me. And I think sometimes when, if we don't look at it this way, we're actually escalating the problem and seeing more big behavior and difficult behavior because we are sort of putting this pot on this little boiling, uh, putting the lid on this, this boiling pot rather than just letting it bubble away nicely and just keeping a, keeping a container around it and sort of helping children to turn it down when they need to turn it down. But that's using our presence and just being able to spy which child is getting dysregulated. I'm going to step in and just gently bring them back down. Uh, I talk a lot about do, using sort of star jumps and physical activities where we can just do, we just do five star jumps together to sort of singing, chanting, drumming, stomping around the room, being really loud, growling. Yeah. Animals. They are all really good. There's a science to that that brings our nervous system back into balance. So spying which children are finding it difficult to regulate and getting in just before it tips over into the overwhelm, you're teaching them how to do it themselves. It takes time. It takes investment. And by goodness, I know it's hard, but we have to do it. If we go, if we really are in the business of, of ensuring that we are creating good future mental health, we have to lay the foundations now and the early years is where it's at. Which is a fabulous point to unfortunately leave our fourth and final episode. It's, you know, I mean, there've been loads of massive takeaways for me. I've loved it. But I think for anybody listening, the idea that there is no such thing as naughty is a really important one to cling on to because if, if you say to somebody there's no such thing as naughty and they say, well, what is it then? That's when you go back to the second point, which is we start with the brain. And we come back to the brain. And if the science tells us this is a truth, then we need to make sure we create an environment that values that truth because that's the thing that's going to enable our children best of all. Uh, Kate Silverton, it has been an absolute pleasure to chat to you. Um, if people want to find out more about you and your work, where can they look and what would you recommend? Oh, thank you. So, well, my first book is called There's No Such Thing as Naughty. That is for naught to five. Um, and I talk about the womb environment as well and how our children's brains are developed and uh, all the neuroscience, but explained super simply. Um, and I, I, what else can I tell you? So my second, well, what else can I tell you? I think, well, just 
look online. Just Google you. Google. Really, yeah, well, I'm not very organised at the moment because I've just written the second book and I've been in this bunker. I went dark, basically, and no one's heard of it. So I've sort of tried to jump on. I'm not really big on social media, but I am um, doing much more now on my website, katesilverton.com. But also I try to use Instagram just because I find a lot of parents that way. I'm really open. And as I say, I'm always up for feedback because I know that we, 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 we're trying to sort of create this utopia, often in very challenging circumstances. But I also, and I must shout out to all the practitioners who I know are doing this already and are passionate about yeah, it absolutely. so can we all get together and find best practice I, I'm learning you tell me what, what works and what doesn't work and what we need and I will do my bit in trying to ensure that we put our children first and I will do whatever I can as a journalist and if I get to work politically or whatever so I can take messages because things do have to change but um, you know I know that there's a lot of good already being done and thank you uh, for listening and uh, for doing the work you do because it's incredibly important. Yeah, once again, Kate, it has been fascinating and I cannot wait for the revolution. I am right there with you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kate. Thank you so much, Alice. It's been lovely, really lovely to see you. I would just like to say a huge thank you to our guest, Kate, for joining us and providing such valuable insights. You've been listening to the TTS Talking Early Years podcast with me, Alistair Bice clegg and Kate Silverton. And if you've been inspired by our conversation today, then don't forget, you can sign up via the link in our episode notes to be the first to hear about future episodes and access exclusive follow-up content, including ideas for your setting and links to relevant resources. 